الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We continuing on with the tafsir of Surah Al Buruj. And we got to the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, Qutila Ashab al Ukhdud. Qutil, here, uh, the word, obviously the Arabic word, the Qaf, the Ta, and the Lam, it means to kill, right? And so Qutila means to be killed. To be killed. However, Many of the scholars of tafsir, they said that Qutila here means Lu'ina. Lu'ina, may they be cursed. May they be cursed. Uh, and this here, uh, the word curse or Allah in the Arabic language, it is to be cast out from Allah's mercy. That's what the word cursed means. So some of the word, uh, some of the scholars of tafsir, uh, they said Qutila uh, means Lu'in. And It's also said that the word Qutila here refers to the fact that these people killed the Muslims. That they were, and the Muslims were killed, uh, the Muslims were killed by them. Ibn Jarir rahimahullah ta'ala he said that Qutila here means Lu'in, means to be cursed. And that is to be cast out and to be far away from the mercy of Allah. Or it is a dua against them for them to be killed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is uh, cursing them. May they be, may they be killed. And these two meanings are obviously similar. Now, before we go any further, who are Ashab al uh, The word Ukhdud is a hole or a trench which is dug in the ground. And the scholars of Tafsir, they differed over whether this trench is a specific trench. In other words, is this referring to a specific group of people? Or is it referring to many times that this has happened over history? Uh, and that is that a trench is dug and the people who believe in Allah are thrown into it and they are burnt alive in that trench. And this is something that has happened more than once in history. So it's not something that just happened one time. Although there is a famous story from Bani Israel uh, regarding a particular group of people that were killed in this way. A particular group that were killed in this way. So it could refer to that one particular group that were killed in this way and it could refer to all of the times that the believers have been killed like this. In other words, they dug a trench and they threw the believers into it and they burnt them with fire until they died. Now, before we go any further with the story of Ashab al we need to go backwards. 
And we need to ask ourselves, is there, is this sentence, Qutila Ashab al is this the answer to why Allah swore by uh, the sky and Allah Azawajal swore by Yawm al Qiyamah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore by everything which witnesses and everything which is witnessed? Is this the reason why? Is this Jawab al Qasam? In other words, was ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَوْعُودِ وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشْهُودِ قُتِلَ أَصْحَابِ الْقُتُوبِ Is that the reason why Allah swore by those, those oaths? For, in order to highlight this. Some of the scholars of tafsir said so. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala did it. Ibn al-Qayyim, he said, there is no jawab al qasim here. There is no sentence for which Allah swore those oaths. Allah swore those by those things for themselves. I'm hoping this makes sense. But the idea behind it is that Allah Azza wa Jalla didn't swear by those things in order to make a different statement. But those things in themselves are the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore by them. And that was the opinion of Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. So for example, Allah Azza wa Jalla swore by Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Well, Yawm Al-Ma'ud, Allah swore by Yawm Al-Qiyamah. There is no need for a sentence after that. There is no need for a sentence after that. This Yawm Al-Qiyamah, that's enough. And Yawm Al-Qiyamah, it doesn't need anything further. And some of the scholars of tafsir, they said the Jawab al-Qasam is muqaddar. It's to be understood from the context. And it is something like, لَتُبَعْفُمْنَا You will certainly be resurrected. You will certainly be resurrected. So, others, they also said other things as well. Some of the scholars of tafsir, they said that the sentence that is intended is, إِنَّ بَطَ شَرَبِّكَ La uh, that the uh, torment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is certainly uh, is certainly severe. The vengeance of your Lord is certainly severe. Some of them said this is the reason. So they said all of this was Sama'i Datil Buruj wa Yawm al Ma'ud wa Shahidin wa Mashhud is for the for the point of in Nabata Sharabika La Shadi. However, we think, and Allah knows best, that this is not the case because it's very far away. And we've covered already that, generally speaking, in Arabic, we don't leave a long gap between an oath and between, or between swearing by something and between the purpose. For example, if you were to say, Wallahi. For example, you want to say, Wallahi, I'm a Muslim, for example. It's very rare that somebody says, Wallahi, did you bring that uh, thing that I asked you last week? Oh, okay, really? Yeah, what's your phone number again? I'm a Muslim. Do you see what I mean? It's very rare that you leave a big gap between saying Wallahi and between what you intended to say it for. That's not normal in Arabic that you leave such a big gap like that. And that's why we don't think in Allah knows best that the that the, the sentence intended here is in the battle sharabika lashadid. It's one of two things, and Allah knows best. Either it is a sentence which is understood from the context, la tuba'afunna, you will certainly be resurrected. Meaning, by the heavens that contain the stars, and by the day which has been promised, and by the witness and those that are witnessed you will certainly be resurrected. And that's understood from the, the meaning of the surah. Where did we get resurrection from? The whole surah, the theme of the surah is about resurrection and punishment and or reward for what you have, you know, what you've done, recompense for what you've done and resurrection. So some of the scholars said it's understood that the topic of the surah is under, it makes you understand that the, the sentence intended here is you will be resurrected. You will certainly be resurrected. Or, and Allah knows best, this seems to me to be uh, the better of the, or one of the stronger opinions is the opinion of Ibn Qayyim, that these things are sworn by in of them for their, for their own selves. 
It's not that Allah is swearing by something for the purpose of something else. Allah is swearing by Yawm Al-Qiyamah to show you the importance of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And Allah is swearing by the heavens and by the witness and everything that is witnessed because of the importance of those things. They don't need something else. There doesn't need to be another topic that is intended. Those are, are big enough in of themselves and important enough in of themselves. And Allah knows best. So we go back to Ashab al ukhdud So here we said that these people were a group of the disbelievers. They were a group of the disbelievers. And this group of the disbelievers, they tortured and killed a group of believers. Again, we said the scholars of Tafsir, they differed. Is it a particular story that's intended here? Or the fact this has happened more than once in history, is it that the meaning here in the ayah is every, every group who did this? All of the people who did this. As for which group it is, we don't have an, a text, an Islamic evidence, for which exact group of people is meant by Ashab al -Qdud. However, the closest thing we have, the closest thing we have is a story relating to something that happened prior to uh, the coming of the Prophet وسلم, and after the time of Isa. And that is that a very large number of people were killed in this way. They, uh, there was an, uh, a tyrannical, evil ruler. And that person, when the people accepted Islam and believed in the prophet of their time, then he commanded for them to be, uh, he commanded for them to, to be, have a whole dug. And he told them to recant from their religion and turn back from their religion. And when they didn't, he pushed them into the, the ditch, into the trench, and he burnt them alive. And he sat watching them die like that. Uh, but because this has happened more than once, and because it has happened both inside and outside of the Arabian Peninsula, we don't have a, 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 like a clear evidence which says to us which particular one of these events it was referring to, except that some of the scholars of tafsir mentioned a hadith from the Prophet وسلم, with regard to uh, a particular uh, instance or a particular story. Uh, and we will come to that insha'Allah ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ النَّارِ ذَاتِ الْوَقُودِ النَّارِ ذَاتِ الْوَقُودِ Containing the fire full of fuel. And that was the fire that they tortured the Muslims with. Then Allah Azza wa Jal said, إِذْ هُمْ عَلَيْهَا قُعُودِ They were sitting on it. On top of it, and in other words, near to it. And what it was is that when they tortured those Muslims, they didn't leave them in that fire and walk away. They sat and watched them die. They sat and watched them being tortured in that in that fire. And then Allah said, And they were certainly being they were certainly witnesses or being witnessed as to what they did to those believers. They were certainly being witnessed what it is that they did to those believers. Then Allah said, وَمَا نَقَرُوا مِنْهُمْ their only complaint against those believers was that they believed in Allah Al Aziz Al Hamid. Here it's important to note that those Muslims who were being killed like that and tortured like that, 
They hadn't done anything to oppose that, those people who did it to them. They hadn't fought against them or they hadn't rebelled against them. They hadn't tried to harm them in any way. The only thing that they had done is to believe in Allah. Al-Aziz al-Hamid. Here, there is a very, very important benefit to be had in these two names, Al-Aziz al-Hamid, in this particular context, in this particular ayah. And I actually want to ask you guys a question about this because a lot of times what happens is we come across the names of Allah mentioned in different ayat in the Quran and we don't really think about why that particular name is used here. So Al-Aziz, the name of Allah Al-Aziz, which refers to Allah's might, Allah's power, Allah's honor, and Allah's name Al-Hamid, that Allah is always worthy of praise. What do you understand by these two names being mentioned in this particular ayah? So Allah has mentioned how these disbelievers dug a trench and they threw the believers into it who did no crime except for the fact that they believed in Allah. And then they filled it full of fuel and fire and they set them on fire and they sat and they watched them die. And then Allah describes himself as Al-Aziz Al-Hamid. What is the link between those two names and what was done to those believers? Or I can even make it more general and say, any time the Muslims are tortured, because this is one, like we said, some of the scholars of Tafsir, they said this is not one instance that's referred to here. It's not one particular torture, but it's every time that the Muslims are tortured like this. And expand even to talk about any time the Muslims are being tortured. You know, we see now on the news in places in the world, like torture and the people are being tortured in the worst possible examples of, yani, you cannot even imagine doing these things to even, like to an insect, to an animal, like how you would, how they did to the Muslims. But why did Allah mention these two names, Al-Aziz and Al-Hamid here? Did we have any answers from the people on YouTube? Ultimate power and praise, attribute only to Allah. praise only belongs to Allah. Definitely, that's true. I still am looking for the connection between what happened to those people and between the name of Allah and Aziz al Hamid. No one has answer, huh? Here, there are two things that you need to think about. The first is that real honor and power only belongs to Allah. 
And so the power these people execute over the Muslims, it looks like they were the ones in control, right? Doesn't it look like that? I mean, they, they dug trenches, they burnt them alive, they sat watching. It, it, it feels like if someone were to look at that without Iman, if someone were to look at that picture without Iman, they would say that these disbelievers had complete power over them. When in reality, the situation is the opposite way around. It is Allah that had complete power over those disbelievers. Okay, that's one point. The second point is, Allah Azza wa Jal is praised for all of His decree. Allah is praised for all of the things He decrees. And this can only come with Iman. So their Iman in Allah, that they believed in the Izza of Allah, that they believed that Allah was due praise, even though Allah decreed for those disbelievers to have power over them. Allah decreed those disbelievers to have power over them. And Allah deserves to be praised. Now here, this is, this is something, Wallah, you have to understand it. You have to understand it. You have to understand here the reality of Allah's decree. Everything that Allah decrees is wise. And when you believe that, this is Iman in Allah. This is what shows a person's Iman in Allah. When you believe, or one of the things that shows a person's Iman in Allah, when you really believe that everything that Allah decrees has a wisdom behind it. Look at the atheist today. When you ask the atheist, why are you atheist? You can almost quote them that they will give an example of something like Ashab al -Ukhtut. They will say, how can God exist when people are being tortured? How can God exist when the believers are being, are suffering? Look at these people. They were burnt alive and they believed Iman in the Izza of Allah and that Allah deserves praise for everything. And this wallah is a very, very powerful statement because it shows you that every single thing that Allah decrees is perfect and everything is wise. Now, the question now comes, how can you make that statement? How can it be perfect? The people who believed in Allah, who had Iman, who sacrificed, and they are the ones getting burnt, and the people who are doing the burning are sat with their feet up, by the fire, watching these people die. How can this be worthy of praise? How can Allah be worthy of praise? Wallah, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of praise. I just want you to fast forward 15 minutes from that moment. Where are those people who were burnt in the fire? Jannah. They're getting the reward of the shaheed. The shaheed, a single drop of the blood of a shaheed, they don't feel anything, anything beyond the first drop of blood. And their souls go into the bellies of birds that fly through paradise, right? And they have from the blessings of Allah so much that one of them asks Allah, Oh Allah, send me back to the dunya so that I can be shaheed again. And you know the story of the Sahabi who, when the ruler of Rome, the Byzantine ruler, wanted to put him into, the, in, into a pot of boiling oil and he started to cry. And the ruler thought that he's crying because I got him now, you know, like, I'm going to burn you, I'm going to put you into a pot of boiling oil. He said, why are you crying? He said, I wish I had as many lives as I had hairs on my body so that I can keep on getting burnt in this oil and I can keep on getting the rewards from Allah. Because Wallah, the only thing these people look at is the dunya. You look at that one second and then somebody has the nerve to speak badly about Allah 
but they're only looking at that one moment. They're not even looking at what happens to those people after that. And the, how Allah gives them the reward and the paradise and the high levels that Allah gives them. In Jannah, there are hundred levels that are reserved only for the shuhada. Only for the people who are martyred for the sake of Allah. But look at how the atheists and how many, you know, sadly people have come to think these days that they look at that and say, that doesn't deserve praise. Well, Allah's people got defeated. La Allah. Now let me ask you, where are the people who put them in the fire? Those people who are sitting by the side of the fire, where are they now? Being tortured in the fire of Allah Azza wa Jal, which is greater than the fire that they made for those believers. And they're being tortured in it every day and every night. And when it comes to Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the torture will be worse than the torture they're having in their graves until this day, until this moment now. And they're being tortured in their graves every single day with fire since the day that they lit that fire for those people. Now, doesn't that deserve praise? It deserves. Allah deserves to be praised for that. And it shows you that Izzah belonged to who? Izza belonged to Allah. But the only people who realized that Izza belonged to Allah are the people who believed in Allah. Illa an yu'minu billahi al-aziz al-hamid. Those who believed in Allah al-aziz al-hamid. And that's why I'm fascinated by this. Allah, I'm fascinated by this ayah. I'm fascinated by this ayah in the context of atheism today. Because if you were to ask, I watched a documentary once on atheism, they interviewed a handful of very famous atheists. You know, they went around interviewing many, many, many very famous atheists. And I would say almost all of them mentioned suffering in the world as the reason why they don't believe in Allah. Look at that and then look at this. Their only crime was that they believed in Allah Al Aziz Al Hamid. So these two names here are intended. I'll read you what Ibn Kathir he said, Ta'ala. He said, meaning that they had no sin except their Iman in Allah, Al Aziz, the one who will never disgrace. The one who will never or never cause to be lost, the one that seeks his protection, Al Hamid, who deserves praise for all of his statements and actions and his sharia and his qadr. Even if he decreed for these servants to be or to, to suffer at the hands of the disbelievers, he is Al Aziz Al Hamid. Even if the reason for that is hidden from many people. So Ibn Kathir he explains that many people cannot see the cannot see the, the praise of Allah in that. Many people cannot they cannot see the izza of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't believe in Allah Azza wa properly, or they don't believe in Allah at all. They couldn't see that. And yet, subhanAllah, if you were to look at it in the simplest way, just look at, you know, fast forward 15 minutes or half an hour, or one hour or whatever, and ask, where are those people? Then ask all these people who tortured the Muslims, Fir'aun, Thamud, Ad, Ashab al-Ukhdud, where are they? Where, where are they? فَهَلْ تَرَى لَهُمْ مِنْ بَاقِيَةٍ do you see even any effect left of them? Nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wiped them off the face of the earth and wiped off the face of the earth any remembrance of them. Nobody remembers them, nobody... Uh, and there is nothing worthwhile remaining. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected for those believers that were tortured and that were harmed. Allah protected for them their hereafter. And you need to understand that. Because otherwise, too many people are asking this question. Muslims suffering all over the world. Why are these Muslims suffering all over the world? Allah is an Aziz al Hamid. Wa in khafiya sababuhu ala kathir min al nas. Even though many, many people can't understand why this happened and can't understand the wisdom of it. Just believe that Allah has infinite wisdom and you will start to see the wisdom in just some small examples of the wisdom of Allah Azza wa and what He decrees. Everything that Allah decrees is deserving of praise. Everything that Allah decrees is deserving, is deserving of praise. And the way we see things, and this is the second point I want to highlight, the way we see things is very upside down. We look at things only in the way of the dunya. We only look at, okay, this person lost money in the dunya, this must be bad. We have not even any, you know, we are so ignorant as human beings. We don't even know what will happen tomorrow. We don't even want to know what will happen in that afternoon. And then we have the audacity to accuse Allah, that Allah is not praiseworthy for what he did, that Allah has brought this and there is no reason for it. SubhanAllah. If the person even looked at what happened a few hours later, they would see the wisdom. But people rush. So you must never ever think badly of Allah because something bad happened to some Muslims around the world. Rather, Allah told us many things that will help us here. The first thing Allah told us is this dunya is temporary. This dunya is not meant to be a place of paradise. So the minute you stop expecting paradise from it, you'll be much happier. And you'll be much more comfortable with what happens in terms of the tests and trials of this life, when you stop living in this life as though it's paradise. This life is not meant to be your paradise. There is no promise from Allah that this dunya should be a place of happiness and contentment and comfort and paradise. That's not what it's meant for. So as soon as you're treating this dunya as though it's paradise, you are gonna be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed and you're going to become, start to become disappointed with the decree of Allah, which is the opposite of what a believer is supposed to be. Believer is supposed to have contentment with Allah's decree. But you start becoming disappointed with it because you expect that this dunya should be luxury and should be happiness and should be comfort. That's one thing. The second thing is that what really matters is the hereafter. That's when it really matters. That's what really matters. So if you are successful in the hereafter, it doesn't matter what happened in this world. Because Allah Azza wa doesn't love this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't uh, give it to those necessarily that He loves or that He doesn't love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this dunya doesn't weigh anything in the sight of Allah. We also, when we see things happening, we realize that Allah has told us the cause of those things. And that the cause of those things comes back to us and our sins. Allah has made corruption appear at land and at sea because of what the hands of men have earned. We committed sins and then Allah caused these sins to have an effect upon us and effect upon the Muslims. So we also even know that the hikmah behind it, or part of the hikmah behind it, is so that we may turn back to Allah, so that we repent to Allah, we come back to Allah, we see what happened to those Muslims, we, we realize that we need to come back to Allah. And we change as a, as a community, as, as Muslims, we change and we repent to Allah and we ask Allah to change our situation. The next thing that we have also is the opportunity to help those people and to show the difference between the people who will stand up for the religion of Allah and those who will not. Without tests like this, you cannot see the difference between the people who are going to stand up for Islam and those who are not. You see it when you see these things are happening all over the world 
and you see really people who are, they are really willing to stand up for the sake of Allah. Not by doing haram, because doing haram doesn't benefit. How can you benefit yourself doing haram? How are you going to benefit the Muslims by doing haram? But you see people really, they, whatever Allah has given them, they try for. They are making dua for them, they are trying to give for them, they are trying to send support for them in which any way they are allowed in which any other way is av available to them. So Allah Azza wa Jal shows those people who will support his religion. And these are just some of the wisdoms behind the things that happen to Muslims around the world. We know the cause is our sins. We know that we have to turn back to Allah. We know that Allah Azza wa Jal makes these things happen to remind us that we need to come back to Him. We know that Allah Azza wa Jal makes these, happen, these things happen so that some people can be taken as shuhada, as martyrs. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this world as a place of tests and trials and difficulties. And when we bring all these things together, we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what He decrees, even the worst of calamities that happen to the Muslims, there is praise, Allah is deserving of praise for what He decreed to happen. Allah Azza wa deserves praise for what He decreed to happen. And it's important we understand that. Because this is what will give you the right perspective as it relates comes to the decree of Allah. Allah's decree. What Allah decreed, Allah's qadr. And you understand and you become stronger at bearing bad things when they happen to you. Bad things happen to you, you become stronger. You become, yeah, I understand. That yes, it is very hard. Nobody uh, finds it easy to see something happen to themselves or to their people they love. Nobody likes that to happen. But a person learns lessons from why does Allah decree these things to happen? Because of our sins, we turn back to Allah. To give us an opportunity, to give them an opportunity. Because paradise is what matters, because the dunya doesn't matter, because this is a test and a trial. And all of the many, many reasons, I can't give you all the reasons because nobody knows all the reasons except Allah. But we just pick examples so a person understands why Allah is deserving of praise when these calamities happen to the Muslims. That Allah Azza wa Jal is Azizun Hamid. He is almighty, all-powerful, and deserving of praise. There is another uh, point of benefit that I wanted to take on a different angle from this side. And that is the reality of those people who disbelieve and the reality of our relationship with them. And that is, you should never ever expect the people who differ with you in your religion and they don't believe in what you believe in you should never ever expect from these people that they're going to help you or never expect that these people are going to bring you anything good perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will soften the hearts of some of them for a time but you should definitely not expect and you should understand and take a lesson from history. For example, you can pick any country where the Muslims have been tortured really badly, like Ashab al -Uqdud. Pick any country in recent history or distant history. Now look at how the Muslims behaved with the people who ended up killing them and torturing them. In most of the cases, there was a degree of closeness and a degree of, uh, maybe even in many cases, friendship before this event happened. And when it happened, what happened? The Muslims were, they found the person who was claiming to be, you know, that, that they were going to support them or help them, ended up being the person who lights the fire. That happened in so many times in history. You have to take a lesson from that. That wallah, these people, they don't want any good for you. They don't want good for you. And if they are given an opportunity, they'll be the first one to light. They're going to fight, fight with each other over who lights the match. That is how they will be. 
So don't expect anything different from them. One of the saddest things is when you see the situation of the Muslims today and you see that they expect that these people who fight against Allah, who fight against the religion of Allah, are going to do something good for them or are going to give them some kind of rights or going to somehow look after them. <laughs> like, look at history. Look at what they've done to the Muslims since the... Every country, pick a country, you can see it. And you see many situations that Muslims were very, very close to the same people who turned on them. The same people who killed them. The same people who didn't just kill them. I mean, they didn't pull a trigger and kill them. Yani they tortured them. That is what, that is the reality of the hatred that exists in the heart of those people who disbelieve for Islam and for the Muslims. You have to realize that. And you have to not kid yourself. You know that these people are going to bring you some kind of good. You have to learn a lesson from history and from these events that happened. So you realize that your allegiance is to Islam and the Muslims. Your allegiance is to Islam and to the Muslims. And you can look at examples of what happened to the Muslims uh, in history, recent history, in different countries where the Muslims have been really badly tortured and killed. You can look at more distant history in the, some of the famous invasions where the non-Muslims invaded the Muslim lands. Did they, you know, like Allah just said, La fi zinna illa wa, wa la zinna. Allah, they didn't give you, they didn't give the Muslims any, even the tiniest amount of rights. They didn't give them even the tiniest amount of rights. They didn't even, the way they killed them was not like, you wouldn't even kill an insect like that. They, they slaughtered them. And that's the reality of the situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showed that to you many, many times. So we're not saying that with, with regard to the non-Muslims that you mistreat them, but just don't be fooled by it. Don't be a person who is fooled. As Allah has said, قَدْ بَدَثِ الْبَغْضَاءُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَمَا تُعْفِي صُدُورُهُمْ Akbar. Hatred has come from their mouths and what their hearts conceal is much worse. Some of the scholars of uh, tafsir and history, they said that the people from Ashab al Qdud who tortured the Muslims in the trench, actually they said, and there's no, I mean there's not a narration for this, but they said they fell into it and they died in the same trench that they tortured the Muslims in. They said that when they, when they were sitting, they were sitting on the edge of it and they were watching the, those people die that when they died, the side of the trench caved in and they fell into their own trench and died. And that's another, I mean, if it's true, we don't have a clear evidence for it. It's mentioned in some of the stories of history. If it's true, that's even more of an evidence to show you that al-aqibah lil muttaqin the eventual end outcome will be for the believers. الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض. Here, Allah سبحانه وتعالى continues to to talk about their belief in Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Allah describes Himself. So Allah describes. You two boys can sit separately from me. No, it's okay like that, it's fine. Allah Azza wa Jal describes himself as the one who has the dominion of the heavens and the earth. 
Okay? Everything in the heavens and the earth belongs to Allah. When you, when you hear that everything in the heavens and the earth belongs to Allah, what do you then feel? What do you understand from that? You've heard what happened to those people, how they were killed. Then Allah says, الَّذِي لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ What do you think? That Allah is in control. Everything, everything is in the control of Allah. Everything belongs to Allah. Also, from the things you can take from this is that those people and their lives also belong to Allah. Is that not true? That they also belong to Allah. So it is in the hands of Allah what Allah does. You are a slave of Allah. What Allah does with you is in the hands of Allah. You don't have a, a choice. But from the mercy of Allah is that Allah will not cause you to be lost in the outcome of what will happen, the, the eventual outcome of what happened. Allah didn't cause those people to be lost. But everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens and the earth. Wallahu ala kulli shayin shaheed. That nothing, and here, this is where we bring this topic, we start to bring this topic to a conclusion. Allah Azza wa Jal is witness over everything. We said in the beginning of the surah, wa shahidim wa mashhud. Some of them said the shahid is Allah. Meaning Allah is the one that witnesses everything. Wallahu ala kulli shayin shaheed. Every single thing that is done, every single thing that is done to the Muslims or to someone else, everything that happens around the world, Allah witnesses it. Allah is witnessing. So this gives two things. From the side of the believer, it gives you comfort. How does it give you comfort? It gives you comfort that whatever happens to you, Allah is witnessing. Allah knows what's happening to you. Allah knows what those people did. Allah Azza wa knows and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take each act to account for what they did. That's the first thing. And from the side of, the, of those enemies of Islam, what does this tell you? It tells you that they should never feel that they're going to escape. And this is the intended meaning here towards the people that the Qur'an has revealed to. Because Ashab al-Ukhtut was before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But when this surah was revealed in Mecca, what was happening in Mecca at that time? What was happening to the Muslims in Mecca? They were being tortured, right? They were being tortured. Wallahu ala kulli shayin shaheed. Allah is witness over everything. You saw those Muslims that were being tortured, the likes of the family of Yasir, to whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sabran ala Yasir fa inna maw'idakum al-jannah. Be patient, O family of Yasir, for your destination is paradise. So here, the those people from Quraysh who were torturing the Muslims, what did they now? Now they are scared. Because Allah reminds them of Ashab al Uqtud, the people who did this and they lit the trench and what happened to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what they are doing. Allah will take them to account. As Allah will take them to account, so Allah will take you to account. O Quraysh, for what you are doing to the Muslims at the time this surah was uh, was revealed. And this increases the Muslim in a sabr And really, if you were to take all of the things that Allah said about himself in this surah, it makes a person very strong in bearing and coping with calamities that happen to them and to other people around them that they love. Allah told you that He is Al-Aziz, so all honor and power and might is in His hands. 
that he is al Hamid. Everything he does is worthy of praise. There's a wisdom in everything he does. He told you that everything in the heavens and the earth belongs to him, and he told you that he is a witness over everything. If you take these four things, this is what it does. It builds your heart to be extremely strong and extremely uh, patient in the face of uh, calamities and hardships. It makes you extremely strong and it makes you extremely patient in the face of calamities and hardships. And that is one of the things that you see from the surahs that are Makkiyya, the, the surahs that were revealed in Makkah. You see this. That Allah Azza wa is building these characters within the believers. And Allah Azza wa tells them what happened to the people before and how they remain patient upon it. And the Prophet وسلم, said, there came before you a man who was sawn in half and he did not leave his religion. They cut him in half and he didn't leave his religion. He didn't leave his religion. These, uh, this part of revelation is making the hearts of the believers strong and making them have sabr and patience in the face of calamities. And it's building that characteristic in them so that they are able to manage the situation that they were in in Mecca. And they came out of that. And look at what they achieved. Look at what they achieved with the permission of Allah when you look later on to Medina and what the Muslims did with the help of Allah Azza wa You see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these people were not like ordinary people. Allah Azza wa gave them a special tarbiya, a special nurturing. He nurtured them to be extremely, extremely strong, extremely patient. They suffered some of the worst uh, torture and attacks anyone has suffered in history. And they came out of that and they went on to do the things that we read on the, in the seerah, in the battles, in what, how the society was and what happened when the Muslims were in control in Medina and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the whole of the, that part of the land and that part of the earth, all of it came to Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built this, these characteristics inside of them and built up their hearts. And this is one of the things you see in the surahs that were revealed in uh, that were revealed in Makkah. Uh, I wanted before we finish to uh, put them up here. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions, they can ask them on the while we're waiting for the people to ask the questions. I want to bring the hadith from Sahih Muslim. Hadith in Sahih Muslim here, the number of the hadith is 3005, I think, in Sahih Muslim, from the hadith of uh, Suhaib radiallahu anhu. Uh, there lived a king before you, and he had a magician. As the magician grew old, he said to the king, I have grown old. Send a young boy to me so that I should teach him magic. The king sent to him a young man so that he should train him. And on his way to the magician, the man found a monk sitting there. The man listened to the monk's talk and was impressed by it. It became his habit that on his way to the magician, he met the monk and he sat there and he came to the magician late. The magician beat him because of the delay. He made a complaint of that to the monk and he said to him, When you feel afraid of the magician, Say, members of my family had detained me. And when you feel afraid of your family, say, the magician had detained me. 
It so happened that there came a huge beast of prey and it blocked the way of the people. And the young boy said, I will come to know today whether the magician is superior or the monk is superior. He picked up a stone and said, O oh Allah, if the affair of the monk is dearer to you than the affair of the magician, cause death to this animal so that the people should be able to move about freely. He threw that stone towards it and killed it. And the people began to move on the path freely. The young man came to the monk and informed him. And the monk said, Son, today you are superior to me. Your affair has come to a stage where I find you would soon be put to trial. And in case you are put to trial, don't, uh, don't give information about me or don't tell about me. The young man began to treat the blind and those suffering from leprosy. And he began to cure people from all kinds of illness. When the companion of the king who had gone blind heard about him, he came to him with numerous gifts and said, If you cure me, all these things that collected here would be yours. He said, I myself do not cure anyone. It is Allah. I myself do not cure anyone. It is Allah who cures. And if you affirm faith in Allah, I will ask Allah to cure you. He affirmed his faith in Allah and Allah cured him. And he came to the king and sat by his side as he used to sit before. The king said to him, who restored your eyesight? He said, my Lord. Thereupon he said, it means your Lord is one besides me. He said, my Lord and your Lord is Allah. So the king took hold of him and tortured him till he gave a clue of the boy. The young man was summoned and the king said to him, O oh boy, it has been conveyed to me that you have become so proficient in your magic that you cure the blind and those suffering from leprosy and you do such and such a thing. Thereupon he said, I do not cure anyone. It is Allah who cures. Then the king took hold of him and began to torture him. So he gave a clue about the monk. The monk was summoned and it was said to him, you should turn back from your religion. He refused to do so. Then he ordered for a sword to be brought. And when it was done, the king placed it in the middle of his head and tore him into parts until he fell down. Then the courtier of the king was brought and it was said to him, turn back from your religion. And he refused to do so. Then a sword was placed in the middle of his head and it was torn till a part fell down. Then the young boy was brought and it was said to him, turn back from your religion. He refused to do so. And he was handed over to a group of the courtiers and it was said to him, take him to such and such a mountain. Make him climb up that mountain and when you reach the top, ask him to renounce his faith. But if he refuses to do so, then throw him from the mountain. So they took him and made him climb up the mountain. And he said, O oh Allah, save me from them in any way that you wish. Then the mountain began to quake and they all fell down and the person came walking to the king. The king said, what has happened to your companions? He said, Allah, save me from them. Then he handed him to some other met people and he said, take him and carry him in a small boat. And when you reach the middle of the ocean, ask him to renounce his religion. But if he does not renounce his religion, throw him into the water. So they took him and they said, O oh Allah, save me from them and what they want to do. The boat turned over and they were drowned. And he came walking to the king. And the king said to him, what has happened to your companions? He said, Allah, save me from them. Then he said to the king, you cannot kill me until you do what I ask you to do. He said, what is that? He said, you should gather the people in a plane and hang me by the trunk of a tree. Then take hold of an arrow from the quiver and say in the name of Allah, the Lord of the young boy, then shoot an arrow. And if you do that, you'll be able to kill me. So the king called the people in an open plane and tied the boy to the trunk of a tree. Then he took hold of an arrow from his quiver and he placed the arrow in the bow. And he said in the name of Allah, the Lord of the young boy, then he shot an arrow and it hit his temple. The boy placed his hands upon the temple where the arrow hit him and he died. And the people said, we affirm our faith in the Lord of this young man. We affirm our faith in the Lord of this young man. We affirm our faith in the Lord of this young man. The courtiers came to the king and it was said to him, do you see that Allah has actually done what you tried to avoid? The people have believed in the Lord. The king commanded ditches to be dug at important points in the path. When these ditches were dug and the fire was let in to them, it was said to the people, he who will not turn back from his religion will be thrown in the fire or it will be said to him, jump into the fire. The people courted death but did not renounce their religion till a woman, a woman came with her child and she felt hesitant jumping into the fire and the child said to her, O oh mother, endure this ordeal for it is the truth. This is the hadith in Sahih Muslim. The hadith is authentic without a shadow of a doubt, the hadith in Sahih Muslim. But what is not clear is that is this what is referred to in the ayah? Does that make sense? The hadith is clear that at the end of the hadith, 
the king dug a ditch and he commanded all of those people who believed in the boy to be thrown into, uh, into the ditch, who believed in Allah and who believed in what the boy, uh, the message that the boy was bringing, to be thrown into the, into the ditch. Some of the scholars of tafsir, they linked this hadith to the ayah. So they said, Ashab al-Ukhdud is the king and the people who, who dug the ditch. But what's not clear is, it's not, it's not clear that this is the tafsir of the ayah or is the ayah general for everyone that, who this happened to. Because it happened more than once in history and Allah Azza wa Jalla's best. Do we have any questions? Did that make sense today? Kind of. No, okay. That's what Allah made you to mention Allah was best with Salat wa Salam Ali bin Muhammad wa ala Ali wa Sahbihi. Jazakumullah khairan for watching. Please subscribe, share, and you can visit muhammadtim.com.